Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So far, we have considered in detail uh, the structure of many metallic elements and also especially the structure, the void structure that is where the voids are present, how they are distributed and how these voids are coordinated with the parent host artist atoms. Now, we will consider uh, the addition of alloying elements to these pure elements and we will see some of the uh, important structures which come about, what happens to this alloying element etcetera. Uh, these alloying elements when a, especially in a pure metal when you add other elements and especially when you do so intentionally they are called alloying elements. Though in principle there is no difference between an alloying element and an impurity, but it is the intentionality which comes into picture. Even if an impurity is present it would uh, given the type of impurity it will occupy this perhaps the same positions as an intentional alloying element would occupy and its role on the properties would be identical. But only thing is that when you are talking about an alloying element it has been intentionally added to engineer some important properties in the material or to study some important aspects of phase evolution. So, this might be scientific or engineering oriented goals. When the alloying element is small in quantity often it is called doping. So, doping is the term used when you add a very small amount of uh, uh, an alloying element and this is typically done in semiconductors wherein you want to produce an n type or a p type semiconductor say for instance in silicon. Now, the alloying element when you add can be accommodated in one of the three possibilities as shown here. So, when you add an alloying element uh, it can either segregate that means, it has no solubility in the or a very little solubility in the parent lattice and therefore, it gets segregated. Suppose, I am talking about a single crystal then obviously, it can get segregated only to the surface. And Suppose, you are talking about a polycrystal or a uh, crystal with lot of defects, then there are other possibilities wherein this other alloying element can go. The second possibility when you add an alloying element is that it can form a solid solution. Now, solid solutions are in some sense like liquid solutions, but they have certain uh, very important differences when you contrast them with liquid solutions. When you are talking about a solid solution, there are two types the interstitial solid solution and the substitutional solid solution. And further, both these type of solid solutions can be ordered or disordered. And of course, we will take up each one of these cases in some more detail in the coming slides, but this is an overview of the possibilities. The third possibility is the possibility that the alloying element can form a compound or an intermediate structure, and this intermediate structure would have a new crystal structure that means it would not correspond to the any of the parent, um, it would not correspond to the parent. Uh, lattice, but would be a new structure and we will see that these intermediate structures are could be very different from the normal valency compounds which we often deal with in chemistry. Therefore, to summarize this slide there are three possibilities when you add an alloying element to a material and this alloying element could be in a large quantity or a small quantity and I am talking about small quantity it could be even in parts per million in which case you would call it doping and this alloying element could occupy one of the three positions or could go into one of the three possibilities with respect to the host lattice. Either it could segregate or phase separate that means, that it has got very low solubility in the parent lattice. The alloying element added could form a solid solution and these solid solutions could be interstitial type or substitutional type and as we shall see that this solid solution could be ordered or disordered and finally, it could form a compound or an intermediate structure. So, let us take up the first case which is segregation of phase separation and when I am talking about segregation I mean that the alloying element has low solubility and whenever I add more than the solubility limit then the extra material added would obviously segregate and we should note that whenever I am talking about negligible solubility or zero solubility what I exactly mean is that the it is limited to very small amount. Zero solubility theoretically is not possible because we know that because 
there will be a reduction in Gibbs free energy due to entropic benefit and therefore, some small amount of the alloying element would always dissolve in a parent lattice. Okay. So, this is coming purely from the uh, benefit in Gibbs free energy if you are working at constant temperature and pressure and that is the benefit to the Gibbs free energy is coming from the multiple configurations which are possible when you add an alloying element. Therefore, some little solubility is always guaranteed, but in this case what we are talking about is a larger quantity of solubility that means, a larger amount of the alloying element is trying to be put into the matrix and if that solubility is very limited then it may segregate. Of course, this segregation uh, can be called a separate phase and when I mean a separate phase suppose I have two elements A and B then the two insoluble phases in each other would be that the phase A would have a little amount of B and the phase B would have a little amount of A. And typically when um, you talk in a language you will call them the terminal solid solutions and you will call them by alphabets alpha and beta. Okay. So, there is some little solid sol, uh, solid solubility which is always guaranteed and you would call them the terminal solid solutions alpha and beta. Um, Sir, what is the difference between solid solution and liquid solution actually such as LCP this is a liquid solution and also is uh, called a crystal liquid crystal, but uh, solid solution it is alloy or something different. Okay. A good question, uh, when I am talking about a solid solution definitely it is an alloy. Yeah. So, especially uh, I could give an example you could add copper to zinc or you could add manganese to aluminum and there are so many other possibilities. So, these are all examples of alloys and we will take up some more examples in the coming slides. In a liquid solution as you can note that there is no specific lattice of the host, there is no specific position into which a solvent atom would go into. But in the case of solid so, uh, this crystalline solutions, we note that there is a parent lattice and therefore, with respect to that lattice my whole solubility or the solid solution has to be discussed. And as I mentioned that um, you could have interstitial solid solutions in which case the added atom would go into the interstitials or it could be a replacing a parent atom. And there are very specific cases wherein an atom would go into either the interstitials or the host position. So, there are all those kind of possibilities also which are very rare. So, why how is it called solutions? These are some solid alloys. Yeah, precisely uh, they are called solutions because it is a hangover of the terminology from liquid solutions, but essentially what you are selling is true that they are an alloy. Okay. Okay. So, as I said if you are not talking about a single crystal wherein the segregation can occur only at the surface, then if you are talking about either a polycrystal or you are talking about a material with lot of defects, we are not yet consider some of these defects and therefore, uh, we will take these things up later during our course, but it is just worthwhile to note at this point of time. Suppose I did not have a single crystal, but a polycrystal and let me draw a crude schematic of the polycrystal on the board for you to understand. For instance, now as you know any real material has to be finite and therefore, it, it cannot be infinite extent in space. So, this is my single crystal and suppose this is a particular planes in my single crystal which are for instance, if I consider a an FCC crystal for instance this could be the 1 0 0 planes. Okay. Now, if this single crystal then this is all the crystal I need to consider, but suppose I am talking about a polycrystal and any common metal for instance a copper wire or in a piece of aluminum which is used in structure or all polycrystals. In fact, single crystals are much rarer to find. Then you would notice that there will be other regions around it other crystals for instance this is of course, a crude schematic which have different orientation of these one one planes. Of course, this is a two dimensional picture in three dimensions this would be could be the 1 0 0 planes and alternately I could even draw for instance the 1 0 0 direction in some of these and I can show that say in one of these other ones the 1 0 0 plane could actually be coming out or the direction coming out and again some inclination. In other words each one of these crystals is oriented differently with respect to its neighbors okay. and therefore, the alloying element I add if it is not soluble within the crystal can either go to the free surface assuming this is now my free surface. So, it can go into this free surface or it could get into the grain boundary region. So, it could actually get let me use a different color chalk grain boundaries are typically regions of higher free volume and so therefore, it could get into these grain boundary regions.
than 4 g. We are allowing element to go and sit here. Obviously, the amount of grain boundary region per unit volume of the material uh, would be a function of the grain size. You go to smaller grain sizes, you would find that that means grain size being the size of this crystallite. Smaller the grain size you go, you will get larger amount of grain boundary area per unit volume, but you have to remember this is still a limited amount of volume available for a volume of the sample. Therefore, the amount of material which can go into uh, for instance this grain boundaries is very limited as compared to the total volume of material available. So, even in this case the segregation to the grain boundary would mean a small amount of material as compared to the total volume of uh, sample available. Uh, again further there could be even lower dimensional uh, effects for instance there are line defects known as dislocations and the material you added for instance I can give an example for instance carbon in uh, BCC ion can go to these dislocations and sit there the, typically the dislocation cores, but again the amount of uh, dislocation core available would be a function of the dislocation density, but again is small compared to the total volume of the material, but these are possibilities in other words when I add a alloying element and it has exceeded its uh, uh, saturation limit, solubility limit then it will go and sit in one of these other places and this has profound uh, consequences in terms of the properties of the material. For instance, when urban sits in BCC ion uh, you will find an effect known as the yield drop when you do a stress strain diagram. When certain materials for instance go and sit in the grain boundary they can severely affect the properties of the material. To give an extreme example for instance when you add gallium in aluminum it can actually go and sit on the grain boundary and often the gallium diffuses through the grain boundary very fast and actually can lead to severe weakening of the crystal and often this crystal would just separate under tension. So, in other words when I am having adding an alloying element the alloying element itself is going to give me some effect when it is within the host crystal, but additionally when it tries to segregate to some of these other defects in the material it could cause very different kind of effects in terms of the material behavior. Now, when I am talking about a solid solution and especially a solid substitution solid solution, then uh, the solubility is governed by a set of rules of course, these are guide, guidance rules and they are not uh, what you might call strict uh, theorems, they are more like guidance rules and these are known by the name of the hume rothery rules, which we will take up next when you are talking about solid solubility. The second possibility is which you have been of course, discussing already is the possibility of the formation of a solid solution. In this case I am assuming that I am within the solubility limit and often the solubility limit could be pretty large. The extreme case would be when I am talking about an element A and B and any proportion of A, proportion of A is soluble in any proportion of B. In the, the liquid analog you can talk about al, for instance al, alcohol in water mixture, alcohol dissolves in water in any proportion. Similarly, you could have a solid solution case and uh, wherein you can add any amount of A into B and this kind of possibility only exists in substitutional solid solutions and in the case of interstitial solid solutions typically you do not find complete solid solubility. And this we had already discussed when we are talking about the voids in some of these simple crystal structures we had noticed that when you uh, add a parent uh, or a alloying element which goes into the void then it causes a distortion to the lattice and therefore, it causes energy to the system and hence when you cannot add too much of this alloying element to the interstitial positions. And we will also see that in, uh, when you are talking about uh, ordered systems you can even have interstitial uh, solid solution which can get ordered. Now, to uh, what I call emphasize the point which Patel made the mixing is at the atomic scale and is analogous to a liquid solution. Now, in the context of these solid solutions it is worthwhile to note uh, that when you have pure components we typically denote them by alphabets like capital A, B, C. When you have solid solutions we denote them by alpha, beta and gamma typically for instance alpha and beta are used for terminal solid solutions that means solid solutions which are close to the pure compositions A and B. And you could have ordered solid solutions as we mentioned before and you use a prime this prime is used to designate that we are using talking about an ordered solid solution. So, suppose I had a disordered solid solution I will call it alpha and the ordered version of that would be called alpha prime. Just to summarize this slide once more when I add a parent uh, to the parent lattice or to the parent crystal when I add an alloying element depending on the typically on the size of the alloying element either it can replace or go and sit in a lattice position or uh, of course, when I say lattice position I mean that uh, any one of the lattice or motive positions any positions available 
part which were in the uh, large size stratum sit or it could go into one of the interstitial positions okay. and further these solid solutions can be disordered or ordered. Now, I talked about the Hume row 3 rules which govern the uh, rules which tell you that when would I get extensive solid solubility in the case of substitution solid solution and these are empirical rules which govern the formation of substitution solid solutions. These are simple rules to understand and they can be rationalized in terms of our usual common sense materials thinking. The first one is that the solute and solvent atoms do not differ by a large in other words large size the difference in diameter is typically less than 15 percent smaller the uh, size difference larger we expect the solubility to be. This is obvious because when you put a atom into a parent lattice which is very large very different in size as compared to the host atom then the distortion cost to the lattice would be large. The second rule says the electronegativity difference between the elements is small this is again easy to understand if there is an electronegativity difference which is very large then there would be a tendency to form compounds and not form uh, solid solutions. Again the valency and crystal structure of the elements is same. So, the closer the uh, valency and the crystal structure the closer would be the solid solubility. Now, this is again easy to understand what these rules are in other words saying is that like dissolves like. So, if you have elements which are very similar in size in valency in crystal structure then the solid solubility would be extensive. Now, suppose let me take another extreme so the crystal structures are very different for instance one is an FCC other is an HCP or one is a BCC and other is say a tetragonal crystal obviously a complete solid solubility of A in B is not possible because on one hand you have a say a face centered cubic crystal other hand you have an hexagonal close pack crystal. So, somewhere you can notice that the transition has to take place and that means that complete solid solubility of A in B or B in A is not possible in that case. There is an additional rule which is cited along with the Hume row 3 rules which says that an element with higher valency is resolved more in an element of lower valency rather than vice versa. So, we will take up an example to actually illustrate this principle that how an element with higher valency is dissolved more in an element of lower valency than the other way about. So, we will take up an example to understand this. So, let us look at the applicability of the Hume row 3 rules and also the exceptions with regard to some specific examples. The first example here is uh, these three examples here in this table are examples wherein you find complete solid solution in all proportions. That means, I could take element A in 40 percent or 20 percent or 5 percent or 95 percent and add element B which is of course, the specific element here in this table and I would get complete solid solubility. That means, I would obtain a solid solution these examples are silver gold copper nickel germanium silicon and you can see that the first two relate to an FCC FCC solid solution germanium silicon are both diamond cubic crystal structures. Now, if you let me take the first example silver and gold both have the same crystal structure both have ra the radius of the atoms is very very similar to the second decimal place they look very similar the valency is very similar and the electronegativity difference is also not too large. So, I obtain complete solid solubility between silver and gold and you know that silver and gold are noblish metals wherein you would expect complete solid solubility. Now, the second example is between copper and nickel and if I look at the crystal structures again the crystal structures are both FCC the size difference the radius of the atoms is almost similar in fact, it is uh, only different in the second decimal place this is 1.28 angstrom this is 1.25 angstroms the valency is different, but again not too much and the electronegative difference is also not too much. So, this is a second example wherein you find complete solid solubility between copper and nickel. The third example is of course, an interesting example because it happens to be diamond cubic crystal and in the diamond cubic uh, uh, crystal structure of course, you have atoms located at 0 0 0 and quarter 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 and suppose I take a germanium crystal and start adding silicon it would go and replace any one of the atoms in any of these position and would continue to be tetrahedrally bonded to the other atoms in the crystal structure. If you look at the radius they are very similar of course, this even this difference for instance uh, would mean that the uh, there will be some strain, but the strain would be small. The valency is identical and the electronegativity difference is also negligible. Therefore, you can see that these are nice examples wherein you get 
complete solid solubility wherein the elements obey our Hume row 3 rules. Okay. Now, um, the exception to this also exists in other words when you find that some of these uh, parameters are satisfied even then you may not get complete solid solubility and the example usually cited is the copper gamma ion example uh, wherein some of these criteria are satisfied and still you never find complete solid solubility. So, the, as I again point out just to emphasize the uh, important thing these are guiding principles Hume three rules are guiding principles and it is not a strict rule in the sense that if these rules are satisfied then you would get uh, complete solid solubility and the example here to disprove that it is actually not a theorem is the fact that there is the example of the copper gamma ion wherein you do not find complete solid solubility. Now, uh, I had mentioned when I had talked about the Hume row 3 rules that an element with higher valency is dissolved more in an element of lower valency than rather than vice versa. So, just to illustrate this with an example I have got an example here and this is the example of copper and zinc. So, you can straight away see that there is no reason to expect complete solid solubility in this case because copper is FCC and zinc is HCP. So, there, there is no possibility for us to obtain complete solid solubility. Now, if you want to contrast it with liquids then this crystal structure aspect is obviously absent and therefore, some of the guiding principles would be very different. Now, when I am talking about solubility if you see that copper has a valency 1 here and zinc has a valency 2. So, the higher valency element is zinc and as the rule says the higher valency element dissolves more in the lower valency element and the solubility in this case happens to be 35 percent. That means, I can dissolve 35 percent zinc in copper while if you look at the other part of the diagram that how much of copper can I dissolve in zinc. So, copper is the lower valency element and zinc is the higher valency element and therefore, you can see the solubility is very limited it is only 1 percent. So, just to reiterate the, reiterate the principle and summarize this diagram, so that you have a better understanding of this rule. It says that, so let me since I have got this slide in front of me let me revise the Hume row 3 rules for you and these empirical rules. The solute and solvent atoms do not difference uh, in size by more than 15 percent that means, they should have as similar a size as possible. The electronegativity difference between the elements is small the valency and crystal structure of the elements is as similar as possible. An additional rule which is what I was explaining now is that the element of higher valency is dissolved more in an element of lower valency rather than vice versa. And the example I am citing now is the example of copper and zinc and as I pointed out because the crystal structures are different there is no reason to expect complete solid solubility, but then when I am trying to track the asymmetry in the solubilities that how much suppose I call this A for instance and I call this B then I am asking the question how much of uh, B would go into A and how much of A would go into B I can clearly see that this asymmetry is pronounced it is not a just a slight asymmetry that means asymmetry with respect to the 50 50 percent composition. The element with higher valency zinc dissolves much much more in copper and that is 35 percent and the element with lower valency which is uh, copper dissolves very little in zinc and of course, these solid solutions if I am talking about a solid solutions which lie in this region let me take up a different pointer for instance. So, I am talking about solid solutions in this region then obviously, all these solid solutions would have a FCC structure that means, I will have a parent host crystal made up of copper atoms wherein I will slowly as I increase my percentage of zinc I will keep on replacing more and more of copper atoms with zinc atoms. On the other hand these solid solutions, so for instance using my normal terminology I could call these solid solutions of alpha and these solid solutions as beta and when I am using alpha and beta I mean they are disordered solid solutions. So, in this region for instance wherein I am finding beta obviously you will have an HCP crystal wherein in the zinc crystal structure I would slowly replace some of the atoms with copper. So, this is my um, copper zinc system. We will also later on discuss some other interesting crystal structures from this very same copper zinc system. Okay. Now, um, I had mentioned that when I am talking about an interstitial solid solution or a substitution solid solution, I can have two possibilities the ordered and the disordered structures. 
when I am talking already we have dealt with this concept in uh, when we in the previous lectures that what is a disordered structure, what is an ordered structure and we had clearly seen disordered structures are described by the language of probabilistic occupation. That means, that suppose I have 50, uh, 50 alloy 50 percent of A and 50 percent of B, then I would say that any lattice point there is a possibility suppose I am talking about a simple uh, BCC crystal, then I have 50 percent chance that A occ occupies any lattice point or 50 percent chance that B occupies any lattice point. We on the other hand when we talked about ordered structures, we used a language of sub crystals and sub lattices right, we had used that language. So, we need to understand that um, when I am talking about ordered structures, I need to, use, need to use a language of sub crystals and sub lattices and is importance for us to understand this uh, ordered disorder transformations and typically pick up some examples of these ordered structures. Now, it is typically found that the high temperature phase is the disordered phase, while the low temperature phase is ordered. Wherever you, you do observe ordered disorder transformations, you will see that the high temperature phase is the disordered one and the low temperature phase is the ordered one and we will uh, rash, rationalize it in terms of the Gibbs free energy in one of the coming slides. We already noticed that when we are talking about order, I could be talking about two kinds of order, orientational order and positional order. So, most of the examples we will be taking up in this uh, lectures would be related to positional order, but I will give you one example or perhaps more than one example of orientational order as well. Nevertheless, again they whenever you are talking about a disordered phase orientationally or positionally it will be the high temperature phase and the low temperature phase would be the ordered phase. In the case of positionally ordered structures, uh, we have already seen that the ordered structure can be called a super lattice and the super lattice can consist of more than one penetrating interpenetrating sub lattices and typically each one of these sub lattices is occupied by a specific element. So, we have already seen that you could have one sub lattice, two sub lattice or more sub lattices and we also noticed when we did took up an example on the board that we could actually have two sub lattices one completely ordered with respect to an element say A, the other sub lattice could be actually occupied by two different element B and C and there could be that sub lattice could be disordered with respect to B and C. So, therefore, there are only two sub lattices, sub lattice lay is purely occupied by A, the sub second sub lattice, sub lattice 2 is now occupied by B or C and it is occupied by B or C in a random fashion. And now, the stoichiometry will tell me that how much of each lattice point in the sub lattice 2 is occupied by B or C and that would depend on the percentage of B and C in the alloy. So, these are the possibilities. So, let me take up some examples also to understand this order disorder transformation. The simplest and the nicest example perhaps is the example of the copper zinc system, wherein you have 50 percent copper and 50 percent zinc. And as I had mentioned, the high temperature phase is the disordered one and the low temperature phase is the ordered one. And now, we will of course, emphasize this later again once more, we have to note that the properties of the system change when you have an order disorder transformation. That means, that the ordered phase and the disordered phase are not the same phases. In fact, they could have different they have different crystal structures and all the properties would change and that is why we need to be careful whenever we are talking about I cannot just work in terms of compositions, I have to work in terms of the exact crystal structure. In other words, I need to know am I working at the high temperature phase or I am talking about the low temperature phase even for a given composition. So, some of these concepts we already covered in detail, so it is not difficult for us to understand them. So, the high temperature phase for instance in a 50 percent copper 50 percent zinc alloy is a BCC crystal structure. In other words, it is a BCC lattice wherein the motif is a 50 percent probability of copper or a 50 percent probability of zinc occupation at each lattice point. Now, this is the BCC phase that means that the fundamental lattice translation vector now is the one which connects atom at 0, 0, 0 to the atom. So, these are identical because now these are identical not in reality because in reality this if you take any region of space this could end up being copper and this could end up being zinc and this could end up being copper so this is a random occupation, but this is now a probabilistic sense of definition. So, that we have already noted because in the very strictest sense this structure cannot even be called a crystal we already seen. So, this is a crystal only in the probabilistic sense that we have already noted and given that uh, important point we already noted that this is actually a BCC crystal 
with the fundamental lattice translation vector the shortest lattice translation vector being half 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 whose length is root 3 by 2 a. See all these aspects we already seen. Now, what about the low temperature ordered phase? The low temperature ordered phase can be now described as two interpenetrating simple cubic lattices or two simple cubic crystals origin of one lattice at z 0 0 0 the origin of the other is at half 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 and the important point now to note this is not a BCC crystal we already know this this is a simple cubic crystal and this simple cubic crystal is has a motif which is one copper atom here and one zinc atom here. Of course, I could always place the origin at half 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 in which case the motive would just switch flip, flip its positions, but nevertheless it is a simple cubic structure. So, when I go from a BCC high temperature phase to a low temperature simple cubic phase which is now uh, an ordered structure the property of the whole material will change along with it. Now, for instance now the shortest lattice translation vector would be this which joins a 0 0 0 to 1 0 0. It is no longer the vector of the form for instance in this case the shortest last translation vector was half 1 1 1 vector and in this case it will be the 1 0 0 vector. Therefore, this ordering uh, transition is also accompanied by change in properties for instance about if I want to describe the slip systems in these two crystals they will be different and the pearl stress for instance the fundamental stress I need to apply to uh, uh, drive plastic deformation in these materials that would change and therefore, many other properties would change along with this change in crystal structure. Now, the question we are asking is that why is the um, uh, high temperature phase the disordered phase and the low temperature phase the ordered one the answer lies in our Gibbs free energy. Okay. So, we notice that the temperature is the weighing factor for entropy that means, at the higher temperatures this structure with higher entropy is stabilized and lower temperature the structure with lower entropy is stabilized. Now, suppose I had two sub lattices of course, assuming that it is a completely ordered system then one sub lattice would be occupied by one element the other sub lattice by the other element copper and zinc in this case and therefore, the number of configurations available to me is none uh, uh, there is just one possible configuration, but suppose I am talking about a disordered phase then I have many very many configurations which can finally, give me a 50 50 probability at each lattice point and therefore, the system becomes configurationally rich and according to Boltzmann equation s equal to k ln omega I would notice that disordered structure is preferred at high temperature. So, this is purely coming from the Gibbs free energy arguments. So, just to uh, summarize this slide and also the concept of um, positional order that I can describe my disordered crystal at high temperatures using a probabilistic occupation model the low temperature phase typically which is the ordered phase which for instance I told you suppose I call this uh, by symbol gamma then I will call this gamma prime because now this is an ordered phase the lower temperature phase then there is a substantial change in properties. Now, for instance this transformation in this particular system occurs at 470 degrees for a composition of 50 percent copper and 50 percent zinc and I can understand this order disorder transformation in terms of the Gibbs free energy driven transformation. Now, uh, I have listed here some of the salient features about ordering and uh, this is an extensive list and I will go through this slowly one by one. So, that we can understand some of the important aspects of this ordering phenomena. Ordering takes place because the A B bonds are preferred compared to the A A or B B bonds. In other words, when I have a structure like this you can clearly see the environment of the copper atoms is completely zinc. So, there is it has got an eight fold coordination of zinc around the copper atoms in this case of course, the environment is random. So, there is no specific coordination out there and therefore, whenever an atom of a different uh, atom prefers different kinds of different types of neighbors that means, the A B bonds that means, the copper zinc bonds are more energetically favorable as compared to the A A or B B bonds then you find the phenomenon of ordering. The important point to note is that the uh, ordered alloy and in the previous example I would call uh, the copper zinc alloy is an example of something known as the intermediate structure and, and this would form in the case of limited solid solubility also systems also. Uh, the structure of the ordered alloy is different from both the component elements for instance in the previous example copper of C is equals H C P, 
but the uh, ordered alloy was a simple cubic had a principal cubic crystal structure. So, we have to note this that the ordered alloy is different from both the parents and this is an important point to be noted. Arun has some questions. First question is uh, what factors govern segregation? Okay. So, we already uh, yes what is the second question? Second question is uh, can uh, we say that uh, substitu substitutional solid solution is always followed by vacancy or because uh, in uh, you say that uh, uh, the allying element will sit on the uh, white some vacancy or some uh, vacancy side is if there is some vacancy it will sit there or, or is it followed by vacancy or some what? Okay. Uh, perhaps two good questions uh, let me answer the first one first. Uh, when I say so let me consider substitutional solid solution if I am talking about um, an element which is soluble that means I am following my Hume-Roth rules and of course, we have already seen that Hume-Roth have their own limitations, but assuming that Hume-Roth rules are cardinal for my explanation of solid solution whenever I do not have those criteria being sol uh, met then the second element cannot dissolve in the parent lattice say in the wherever the lattice it has to replace an atom in the lattice point therefore, it will segregate. Now, the question we are asking of course, is that where would it segregate? Of course, you have only it is a single crystal the only place it can segregate is to the surface. Okay. In a polycrystal and in a defected material there are other possibilities where such a second where the allowing element or the dopant or the impurity whichever way you want to call that added element can segregate. So, these are the other possibilities you have noted and I said that little detail matters a lot to me regarding my material properties as I said if gallium segregates the grain boundary because it cannot dissolve in parent aluminum host atom it cannot replace its host atom aluminum then the material becomes extremely weakened. There are other phenomena which are similarly found in steel wherein the uh, alloying element not only segregates to the grain boundary region, but also could form a compound. Okay. Now, the second question uh, is related to the vacancies. Now, let, let us be very clear the vacancies again of course, we will see that vacancies can be more than one type. So, you raised an important question of what is a vacancy first of all we will answer this what is a vacancy what kind of vacancies exist in crystals in an upcoming lecture. Just for since you asked me this question a vacancy for the sake of audience is for instance if you take an uh, FCC aluminum then is an atom missing from the lattice point. So, suppose I do not have an aluminum atom and ion and it is not present in the lattice point I call that an vacancy. Now, my solid solubility is in principle of course, in a in the simplest sense is not depend on the vacancy concentration because what I am saying is that when I am adding for instance in this case I am adding uh, copper to zinc then the copper is replacing zinc in its lattice position. Okay. So, it is not that of course, then I, I that means replacing means I do not take away the zinc I mean that I am filling larger volume I am adding more unit cells wherein I can uh, in selectively in some of the unit cells I will put copper instead of the zinc originally present. So, there are no vacancies uh, here of course, if I am asking more specific questions of what will happen to the diffusion of these allowing elements which we will perhaps consider later then vacancies play an important role. Yes, if there are pre existing vacancies for instance in the zinc crystal then copper can obviously go and occupy those vacancies as well that is a possibility. How we define solubility because uh, normally we say that uh, at high temperature solubility is more at low temperature solubility is less. So, for segregation we say, said that uh, we should have low solubility very low solubility. So, is there any temperature foundation on that because in case of solid solutions we are saying that high temperature disorder low temperature ordered case or is there any possibility that the high temperature the, uh, because the solubility is more it forms some solid solution or low temperature it form, uh, it okay. leads to segregation. Okay. Now, um, the question you asked is slightly more difficult to answer at this stage because we have not really considered the concept of phase diagram the concept of solubility the concept of solubility with competing phases. Let me give an example even though this is slightly advanced for this stage that suppose I am talking about solubility of carbon which is an interstitial solid solution and we will be taking that up in this lecture uh, a carbon in BCC ion. Now, obviously, this carbon goes and sits in the interstitial position and we have already seen it is actually in the octahedral void position. Okay. Now, the solubility of carbon in alpha ion which is the ion BCC form of ion with carbon in it keeps on increasing to a certain temperature which we call the tectoid temperature, but after that actually decreases. 
because now the alpha phase originally is in uh, coexistence with the Fe 3 C which is cementite, but later on after the eutectoid temperature actually it is in coexistence with the gamma phase. So, actually the solubility decreases with temperature. So, it is not a general rule that solubility always has to increase in the alpha end with temperature that is point number 1, but as a general rule yes because you have this uh, Gibbs free energy benefit therefore, with increasing temperature you would find a larger solubility. So, that possibility exists. So, what is the specific question? Uh, because in solid substitutional solid solutions we are saying that high temperature uh, disordered phase and the low temperature ordered phase, but can be there uh, can there be any possibility that high temperature solid solution forms because high because of high solubility and the low temperature it results in segregation. Absolutely, absolutely that possibility always exists and in fact these po in fact segregation is the opposite of ordering segregation is where a type of atoms want to have a type of atoms around it ordering is a type of atoms want to have b type of atoms around it. So, segregation is the opposite of ordering in other words in some sense segregation is clustering and either, either the system will show ordering or they will show clustering. So, both these possibilities exist though not the same system and the same composition that you have to note. Some systems will show ordering some systems might show segregation. So, that we have to note yes that is absolutely a possibility. So, getting back to this list on ordering. Now, we have noted that the structure of the ordered alloy is different from both the component elements so, that is an important point to be noted. The formation of the ordered structure is accompanied by change in properties. So, this point I had already mentioned and the example would be for instance in perm alloy ordering leads to the reduction in magnetic permeability and increase in hardness etcetera. In other words the ordered structure the disordered structure can be thought of as a solid solution while the ordered structure is something similar to a compound it is something similar to an intermediate phase and therefore, this intermediate phase which has a different crystal structure has different properties and this point has to be clearly understood. And when you consider more examples all the more it will become clear that why the properties would change because the crystal structure is changing. Um, I am talking about ordered solid solutions and of course, when I mean complete here I mean complete ordered solid solutions are formed when the ratios of components or ratios of whole numbers like 1 is to 1, 1 is to 2, 1 is 3 etcetera and in the examples here for instance copper to gold ratios 1 is to 1, Cu 3 U the ratios 3 is to 1 when you find these whole number ratios then the possibility of forming ordered solid solution is uh, complete ordered solid solution is uh, there and it will become, become clear from the uh, for instance even from the previous example it will be clear. Now, suppose I have a ratio of copper to zinc here 1 is to 1 then a complete ordering is possible. If I have more than 50 percent copper say for instance I have 51 percent copper then this system can never get totally ordered because 1 percent of the copper has to either go and sit in the zinc positions or I will have to leave some of the zinc positions vacant so as to maintain my stoichiometry right. In other words in a off stoichiometric uh, suppose I take a copper and zinc off stoichiometry and this is just an example I would the more general example would be a b if I take consider an off stoichiometric composition then such a thing cannot never be obviously completely ordered with respect to that structure. And I just to emphasize the ordered solid solutions are in some sense between solid solutions and chemical compounds. When I mean chemical compounds I am referring to what we normally call the valency compounds or the standard chemical compounds we deal with in chemistry like H 2 O or one of those compounds. So, this is important to be kept in mind that these ordered solid solutions are neither in full sense chemical compounds in which case of course, my stoichiometry will be completely fixed and I cannot change my stoichiometry. They are also not random solid solutions and they are something in between and this is an important thing to be noted. Uh, the degree of order decreases on heating and vanishes on reaching a disordering temperature and in this sense it is not like a compound. In other words and of course, I will tell a little more about what I mean by order and degree of order, how do we define degree of order and what I mean by this word order also and I will tell a little more, but the important point to note is that uh, this disordering does not take place in a, at a single temperature usually where there are special cases uh, and this degree of order slowly decreases and in this sense most of the order disorder transformations are second order transformations and it vanishes that order completely vanishes with an increase in temperature and therefore, this, this uh, behavior of it is not like a normal compound. Um, and this is what I was mentioning before just to emphasize this point once more off stoichiometry in ordered structure can be accommodated in more than one way for instance 
and this is something very important note and the very fact that I have an off stoichiometry in an ordered structure tells me that that structure will never get completely ordered because the as we can see if I am talking about uh, a simple example would be nickel aluminum where I have 50 percent nickel and 50 percent aluminum this is my composition and this forms with a B2 structure and when I say a B2 structure I mean this kind of a structure this ordered structure which is a simple cubic structure. Now the aluminum rich compositions that means that if I have nickel less than 50 percent and aluminum more than 50 percent so I could talk about L Ni 49 Al 51 then the aluminum rich composition result from vacant nickel sites. So, if I because I am removing nickel from nickel sub lattice or the sub crystal automatically it becomes aluminum rich, but the, the important thing to be noted here is the asymmetry between going to aluminum rich side and to the going to the nickel rich side. When I go to nickel rich compositions on their hand that means for instance I could take a nickel 51 aluminum 49 then this result from anti side defects. In other words now since I have more nickel this nickel starts sitting in my aluminum sub lattice that means aluminum sub lattice cannot get fully ordered. What is a fully ordered aluminum sub lattice wherein all the aluminum sub lattice is fully occupied by aluminum, but now because of the composition variation and this composition variation tells me that this is not like an standard chemical compound wherein you cannot tolerate such kind of uh, H2O means precisely 2 hydrogen molecules for every or 2 hydrogen atoms for every oxygen atom, but here I can tolerate this off stoichiometry and nickel rich composition forms when aluminum nickel starts sitting in aluminum sub lattice. So, you can clearly see first number one is the fact that there is a pronounced asymmetry in the way uh, my off stoichiometry is accommodated and this for instance is one uh, nice example when in nickel aluminum system wherein the aluminum rich compositions are occupied uh, are accommodated by putting that means removing uh, nickel atoms from their nickel sub lattice. So, um, already we have seen lot of important things related to ordering the fact that it is uh, you can call an uh, ordered structure as an intermediate structure it forms when you the a b bonds are preferred that means bonds of a different kind are preferred compared to the bonds of the same kind and to uh, which was nicely um, uh, answering some of the questions raised by Arun wherein we saw that if atoms of bonds of the same type of preferred you would have clustering or segregation. And the important thing which we finally saw is that that how this uh, off stoichiometry is accommodated in ordered structures. Now this is uh, just to emphasize some uh, the point which we have been talking about that uh, the high temperature structure is disordered because of the entropic aspect which comes into play and the low temperature structure is the ordered structure. Okay. And as Arun pointed out there are other possibilities wherein you may not get ordering, but actually you may get segregation. And um, so, in this case there is a negative enthalpy of mixing. I was talking about this order and one of the important things uh, we need to is to actually quantify this order okay. therefore, because I told that this is not a 1 0 situation that means it is not like above a certain temperature it is completely ordered and below a certain temperature it is completely disordered uh, or below it is completely ordered and above completely disordered this happens over a range of temperatures in other words in a specific alloy I could have and especially as we seen in the case of stoichiometry alloys I could have a certain amount of disorder built into the system. Now, how do I quantify this order typically this is uh, quantified by something which is called L this L is called long range order that which also gives me a clue that there is something else which I can call short range order. And in fact, we had considered this aspect when we talked about crystals that crystals some cases can have uh, long range order they have short range order and you could have situations wherein you have short range order missing, but there is long range order and the converse is also possible wherein there is short range order present, but there is no long range order. So, this L is the long range order parameter and it is defined as R a minus x a divided by 1 minus x a, wherein R a is the probability that the a sub lattice is occupied by the right atom where and x a is the mole fraction of a in the alloy. So, this long range order is defined with respect to a and equivalently you can describe it with respect to b. So, let me take an example for instance suppose I have an alloy wherein R a is the probability that a sub lattice is occupied by the a atom say 90 percent of a atoms are actually rightly sitting in the a sub lattice that means 10 percent of sitting in the wrong sub lattice. 
So, and my mole fraction is 50 50 that means, I am talking about a b alloy a 50 b 50 alloy. So, I can write this equation as. So, I have 90 percent of my a atom sitting in the right sub lattice. So, my r a is 0 0.9 my composition is a 50 p 50. So, l is r a minus 6 a 1 minus x a and my composition is a 50 b 50 that means, x a is 0 0.5 and 1 minus 0 0.5. So, this is 0 0.4 by 0 0.5 which is 80 percent. So, or 0 point or 80 percent that is better. So, so this means this all are uh, long range order parameters 80 percent or 0 0.8 okay. and as a um, disordering is complete you will find that uh, each atom is randomly present that means that R a will approach 0.5 x a will be 0.5. So, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 will be 0 that means the order L will become 0. So, this is my long range order parameter and as I pointed out that there is another way of looking at order which is at looking at the short range order okay. and this is important for us and let me take two examples here though we are not considered as crystal structures of these two one is C u 3 a u another is C u z n of course, the C u z n is this one we already considered the C u z n example which is nothing but a B 2 structure which is a simple cubic structure but we are not considered the C u 3 a u which we will take up in the upcoming slide. But what I am focusing here is the change in order with temperature and now I am not only talking about the long range order, but I am also talking about the short range order okay. and now suppose I have perfect ordering that means that all my R a atoms are sitting in the right place which means that this is 1. 1 minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5, 1 minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5 that means, L is equal to 1. So, perfect order would be given by long range order parameter 1, complete disorder would be that means, a complete pro random occupation of A and B in both the sub lattices that means, there are no sub lattices would be characterized by a long range order parameter 0. Therefore, my order parameter changes from 1 to 0, this is the extent of my long range order parameter L. So, I can plot my L with respect to temperature. I can see first let me track the uh, long range order parameter which is shown in red the short range order parameter is shown in that means, the existence of short range order is shown in green. Now, uh, you can see that the order slowly decreases and after a certain temperature now this is given by T c there is no order, but the important point to note is that even though when I am talking about no long range order still some short range order might persist this is an this the important message and the only message I want to give from this graph because this is involves some concepts which are not covered so far. Therefore, um, I will not go into the details like what is uh, what I am talking about as a first order or a second order phase transformation, but what I want to point out here is the fact that whenever even though the long range order has vanished the short range order persists ok. This is an important thing to be noted from this and this can be seen for both the C u 3 a u type and the C u z n type ordered structures which are different ordered structures and you can see even here after the long range order has vanished the short range order persists. So, this is something important to note. So, let me consider these two alloys for instance now I have talked about the C u z n I have C u 3 a u and for instance this is described here these two what are these crystal structures how is this ordering different from the ordering we saw in the copper instead of the copper zinc system. So, this also brings us to some more interesting class of alloys some in other intermetallic alloys which are ordered and we have already considered the F C C crystal in detail before right, which is the structure of copper, aluminum etcetera and we have seen that there is an F C C lattice which is now occupied by the single element, but now these are more complicated structures and there are two elements now therefore, this is an alloy and therefore, we have now gone to the next level in terms of the understanding of crystal structures. So, let me understand try to understand the crystal structure of the C u a u which is now an ordered intermetallic alloy. So, when I am saying ordered intermetallic alloy I mean that there are specific sub lattices for for instance the gold and the copper in this case. Now, so this structure clearly is not a cubic structure as you can see because it does not have three uh, four three fold axis in fact, it has just one four fold axis which is the axis 
going upward. So, this is my tetragonal structure. So, this is my tetragonal structure and as you can see that this structure can be understood by replacing all my phase centering positions in the mid plane by copper atoms. So, I have copper atoms are ions sitting in the mid plane while these planes are occupied by completely gold ions or atoms. So, have this, this structure can be understood as alternate planes of copper and gold which pervades the structure and now the symmetry of the structure has been lowered. right? So, now this structure is not a cubic structure, but is actually a tetragonal structure. So, and there is a notation known as the structure Birish notation, wherein certain alloys are named by certain uh, alphabets and numbers and this is called an L10 structure in the structure Birish notation. There are analogous structures like titanium aluminum, which also have the same kind of structure, which is also an ordered alloy. And so, you can see that this structure can be I will just view this structure in more than one way, so that I can understand. So, this is my standard ball and stick model, this is my space filling model, wherein I can clearly see that the gold occupies these phase centering positions and the in these layers and in the middle layer all the phase centering positions are occupied by copper. As the lattice parameters of copper and gold cannot be identical, therefore, this alloy would also have a lattice parameter C, which is different from A. So, this is my C axis and this is my A for instance and therefore, I can see that my A lattice parameter is 3.6796 and my C is 3.67. So, at I would use this kind of a tetragonal unit cell to describe this uh, kind of a structure. Now, let me count the number of atoms of A and B to see that the stoichiometry is actually maintained. So, these 8 gold atoms contribute 1 8 to this unit cell that can makes it 1 plus these two halves give me 1. So, there are 2 gold atoms in the structure, these 4 copper atoms are shared between 2 unit cells that means that gives me 2. So, there are 2 gold atoms and 2 copper atoms in this unit cell that means actually the unit cell formula is C u 2 A u 2 which can be written in least uh, uh, we pull out the common factor as C u A u. So, I can see that the stoichiometry is maintained when I am drawing my structure like this and since there are uh, 4 atoms in this unit cell 2 of copper 2 of gold I can I can describe this in terms of a notation known as the Pearson symbol uh, though little advanced for the stage, but still it is not very difficult to understand that is this is a tetragonal structure which shows this T the P here tells me it is a primitive structure that means it is no longer a phase centered cubic structure it is very very clear and there are 4 atoms in the unit cell. So, this is a tetragonal primitive structure which is which has 4 atoms in the unit cell. Now, let me consider the another kind of an ordered alloy which is also based on my original FCC kind of lattice. So, now we of course, have to notice in this structure this is a lattice point, but these are not lattice points. So, this is for instance not a lattice point, this is not a lattice point, this is a primitive structure, this is not a phase centered cube, this is a primitive tetragonal structure and not a phase centered cubic structure. So, this has to be absolutely clear exactly the same way like we saw that this is simple cubic and not body centered cubic. So, similarly this is not a phase centered cubic structure, but actually is a primitive tetragonal crystal. Now, similarly, but the way to understand this would be very nice if I can start with the FCC kind of lattice and then try to locate in terms of the FCC lattice where my copper and gold are located. So, similarly I will do the same thing and this again to emphasize this is a primitive structure. Now, the formula is C u 3 A u and let me try to uh, locate my atoms within the unit cell. The gold atoms are all located within the corners or the corners of the unit cell. The copper is located at all the face centers. So, again this is a if this is a lattice point this is not a lattice point and this is obvious looking at the environment of the atoms. For instance, this has for instance one uh, another gold atom at its right at a distance of A. Now, if I look at this point it does not have a gold atom to its right at A. So, obviously, the environment here is different from the environment here and as I said we have defined that lattice is such that an array of points is that all points have identical environments. So, that environment criteria is not met therefore, if this is a lattice point this cannot be a lattice point. So, the other atoms will have to go part of the motif. Okay. Now, the second thing after putting uh, starting with an original FCC lattice and creating this primitive crystal, 
I have to note is the stoichiometry. So, I have 8 gold atoms making a total of 1 contribution to this unit cell in terms of gold. Okay. Now, if I look at the uh, blue copper atoms which have been colored blue for better visibility. Now, I can see that there are 6 faces and each one of them is shared half between 2 unit cells. Therefore, 6 by 2 is 3 therefore, I have 3 copper atoms which tells me my stoichiometry for the unit cell is Cu3 Au. So, this is a space filling model of the same and in this space filling model I can have shown these uh, gold atoms transparent. So, that you can see that these inner copper atoms actually form an regular octahedron. So, they are formed in the form of a regular octahedron. So, this blue atoms form an octahedron in the unit cell. Now, what is the crystal structure? This crystal structure is cubic and not it is not lost in its three folds as you can see these body diagonals all of them have a three fold axis and in fact, um, it has got the highest symmetry for a cubic which is uh, it is a primitive it is got 4 by m 3 bar 2 by m kind of symmetry and in the structural variation notation this is called an L 1 2 symbol it has been given this ordered structure has got an L 1 2 symbol and since it is a cubic crystal I all I need is a single lattice parameter to describe the crystal structure and the lattice parameter for Cu 3 Au is 3.75 angstroms. The Pearson symbol as I told you is um, something easy to understand the C stands for cubic because this is a cubic crystal this is a primitive crystal and not a face centered. So, I have put a P and there are 4 atoms in this or atoms and ions in this unit cell the 4 3 of them being copper and 1 being gold. There are analogous structures to this Cu 3 Au they happen to be Ni 3 Al which is also a technologically important compound and T i P T 3. So, my second structure uh, is C U 3 A U which I understand in terms of uh, the original F C C lattice. So, there are two nice structures which I can understand starting from an original F C C lattice of course, modifying it appropriately to fit in different kind of atoms and accompanied with the kind of atoms I put there will be distortions to the unit cell obviously. And that is what is being taken care of here. 